All right, let's get started for today. A couple of announcements. The final contest, the Pac-Man Capture the Flag context, it's optional. Submissions are due tonight by midnight. We'll then run many, many matches throughout Wednesday, and we'll announce the results in lecture on Thursday. Project six is on machine learning. It's the last project. It's due on Friday, May 8th. Um, because Project 4 came out so late right before spring break and now this one's coming out quite late before the end of the semester, um, we're letting you drop the two lowest projects, making it in some sense optional probably for many of you. Um, nevertheless, I encourage you to work on it, maybe now, maybe when the course is over. There's a lot of interesting uh, problems in there related to machine learning. The final prep page is up on edX. Um, most important thing, exam logistics, May 13, 11.30 to 2.30 in the RSF field house. I'll admit, I don't know where that is, but we'll figure it out, and I'm sure you'll figure it out too. Um, the practice final has been released. It's optional, but you do get a point of extra credit on the final if you submit it by Saturday, May 9th. There are lots of office hours, so if there's anything you're not sure about, come to office hours. There are topical review office hours, which are listed on edX and you can accordingly go to specific review sessions. There are also general office hours, and there are also office hours for uh, project six. Any, question about, any questions about logistics? All right, let's get started with our second lecture on applications then. So last time we kind of took a full start on uh, StarCraft. Let's take a new start on it. So StarCraft is a strategy game, real-time strategy game, where you have to think of a lot of things. You have to manage an economy, you have to expand your tech tree. This might allow you to produce units of a certain type, which in turn might allow you to attack your opponent successfully. Why is it hard to build an AI for StarCraft? Well, it's a very complicated game in many ways. Here are some things you need to account for. So, it's adversarial, meaning you're playing against another player. Um, but even though we know how to solve adversarial games, you say, well, just run Minimax, Alpha, Beta, there's a lot more to it. Um, it has a very long horizon, so you could never search all the way till the bottom of the game tree. That'd just be too long a search to run in practice. Um, it's partially observable, meaning that you don't know the full state of the game, um, because you might have, send, have to send out scouting units to figure out what's going on and so forth, so you need to collect information actively to understand what's happening. It's real time, so you don't have much time to do these calculations to make your decisions. There's a huge branching factor. You have a lot of actions available at any given time. It's concurrent, which is a little different from the games we've seen so far in 188, in that your action is taken current, cu concurrently with the other player taking their actions, as opposed to a turn-based system like chess and the way we've done Pac-Man here. And it's resource rich. There's a lot of different resources you might want to rely on uh, during the game. So it's hard in many ways, and so we can't use a single algorithm that we've covered in class to solve StarCraft, so to say. Um, nevertheless, people have tried to build AIs for StarCraft. Um, there was a big competition in 2010. There were 28 teams from many different countries, universities, research labs, and so forth. And so what you got to do is build your own AI, and then your AI would square off against another team's AI, and you'd see whoever is better at playing the game. Okay, so Berkeley had a team, actually, headed up by uh, Dan Klein, and a lot of his students participated in it. Um, it's called the Berkeley Overmind. So let's take a look at what was inside the Berkeley Overmind. If you want to find out more, there's a URL there, overmind.eeks.berkeley.edu, to find out more. So what's inside the Overmind? First of all, it's doing search. It's doing that for path planning because troops have to move around in the StarCraft world and somehow you need to decide how you're gonna to move to some destinations. Um, constraint satisfaction problems are being, are being well, solved uh, to find optimal base layouts or satisfactory base layouts. Um, Minimax is used for targeting enemy units Learning is used for microcontrol, meaning that as you move your troops around, it might be very difficult to model everything about the StarCraft world ahead of time, so it might be easier to 
try to learn to move your troops around rather than try to model everything ahead of time and then plan with that model. Inference is used to track other units. Um, scheduling is used for uh, resource planning. So what you would have there is effectively a constraint satisfaction problem that would be um, solved and the constraint satisfaction problem encodes your scheduling constraints, scheduling on resources. Um, and hierarchical control. You cannot plan at the lowest level for the entire length of the game because it's too many low level steps. So you need to build abstractions. You need to think about things like what kind of units do we want to produce? Um, even though you might not plan ahead of time every single motion that unit might make, you still need to understand that a certain unit might be good or not good, and so be able to reason at it at a higher level, about it at a higher level of abstraction. So let's look at some examples of the Berkeley Overmind in action. The first one is pathing, so it's using uh, search here. So looking at here is the Berkeley Overmind pissing off some enemy troops. <laughs> and that's the way it plans to kind of play a part of the game, because once it pisses them off, they'll chase it, and then it can find another way to where it wants to go and blow something up. Minimax is used for targeting. So what we have here, we actually have a narrated video, so I'll let the student who implemented this uh, speak about this. In this clip, we was set up by a certain enemy base looking for a good opening. Uh, here they found them in the corner of the base uh, where they moved out into the field chart and then start thinking about working on it. And of course, the enemy rushes into the last of the pen, so the Mulus fired off the finish off of the pen and then try to retreat through the safest route uh, in the bottom of the base. They take a few more shots and then run off to fight the undefended barracks the enemy had to hide in the corner of the map. So that's Minimax for targeting. There's some machine learning for microcontrol. So this is to better deal with a specific type of enemy here. So that was the initial behavior, which wasn't that good. It was getting mostly destroyed. Now we learned the spreading out behavior. That was much, much more successful. Um, here is uh, an example of inference, value of perfect information in scouting in action. Again, there's a student narration, so I'll let you listen to that. The important thing is that as our overlord comes in, it's scouted out that Steiner is building Stargate. Stargate is a warehouse building that builds air units. What happens now is that when I go back to the uh, overmind phase, it's immediately started production on an evolution chamber and a creep colony. What these allow it to do is to turn the creep colony into a spore colony, which is an anti aircraft defensive turret essentially. So, I hop back to this protoss space, we'll notice that it's building a Corsair. The Corsair is a fast anti-air unit that in this case would be used for hunting down on the Okay, so what happened here is that thanks to anticipating what the other player is building, they could effectively build defenses, air defenses, air defenses against the other player's attackers, and hence whatever they were building was rendered effectively useless by the time they had it built. Um, so that's all pretty clever. Let's see how the Berkeley Overmind actually did in the competition. So here is a layout of the competition, 28 teams that are kind of lined up and it's a, you square off against another team, you lose, you're out. Um, after a lot of these games have been played, left with uh, Team Crassel and the Berkeley Overmind. And the Berkeley Overmind actually completely dominated winning 0-3, 0-3 in those matches and winning the entire StarCraft AI competition. Um, so if you want to find more, check out overmind.eeks.berkeley.edu. Um, any questions about the StarCraft part?
or any thoughts of somebody who might know more about StarCraft than me? Yes? Um, so what they did when building the system, they had two students who played a game quite a bit. Um, not, not professional level, but playing a lot level. Um, and one of them had trouble beating the Berkeley Overmind. The one who played even more was still better than the Berkeley Overmind. Um, but they did also contribute a lot to some of the strategy that went into what's behind the Overmind. Yes? Um, good question. What did the AI have access to? Was it just pixels or more information? There was actually an unofficial API, which I believe still exists, which was not built by the makers of StarCraft, but tolerated by the makers of StarCraft. And that's what everybody used. And it gave you access to, um, I believe, but I'm not 100% sure about this, I believe it gave you access to game state or, or things that are part of the game. But, well, it definitely gave you access to state of the game. I don't know if it gave you access to full state of the game that well only the things you can see. I believe only the things you can currently see are what you would get state about. But you never have to process pixels in this API. The AI's actions were limited to human actions, but the AI could act a little more quickly in some sense. I mean, humans do a lot of actions per second, is my understanding, but the AI can even do more actions per second. But the types of actions were the same. So if you had super fast hands, you'd have the same set of actions available to you as the AI had available to you. But the AI doesn't have hands, it can just send the command, so it's a little faster. All right, let's take, look, take a look at a second application area, which kind of ties into the question here, which is um, computers interpreting pixels and what's underneath conceptually. Um, so that's the area of computer vision. Um, there's a lot to be done in computer vision. There's a lot of sub areas in computer vision. The one we'll look at is object detection. Admittedly, one of the most popular ones in computer vision right now, partially because it's, it's very challenging and so it's very interesting for people to try to improve what's possible in terms of object detection. And we'll look at two stories here. Um, some sense the landscape has changed quite a bit over the last five years. We'll first look at a story of how things were done up to about three years ago, and then we'll start looking at how things are currently being done. But I think it's good to understand both approaches, even though currently the first thing we'll see is not how people do things anymore. It'll still give you some insight into how computer vision is done in general. So, First pass at object detection, approach one. Um, there are different versions of this, but there's a general family of uh, algorithms that we'll see one, of, one example of, which is using HOG, which is histogram of gradients, plus a support vector machine. So what's the idea here? You get an image. You then pass that image into your HOG processing unit, which extracts edges from that image and then, as a next step, extracts histograms of edges, or histograms of gradients. That's what HOG stands for. Um, and so that's what you see being processed here, going from image to histogram of gradients. How do you get that histogram of gradients after you have the edge image, which you can obtain by running a high-pass filter over the image, essentially looking for high frequencies. You'll find the transitions between different regions. Uh, after running a high-pass filter, you'll find the edge image, from there, you can then pick regions in your image, and in that region, look at all the orientations of the edges in that region and build a histogram. So you discretize, you say, let's consider only 16 possible orientation bins, and you'd bin the, every edge into one of those 16 bins. That gives you a histogram, which is visualized by showing edges in different directions, and uh, bolder, thicker edges in a certain direction if there's more activity of an edge in that direction in that region. So this is a new representation of the original image. You're losing a lot of information, right? So you see what comes out of the hog processing unit. 
is not exactly what went in. Um, but maybe that's a good thing because we're trying to look at the essence of what's in an image because that will make it easier to generalize to new images. So let's take a look if, if we can see what's in an image. So here is hog applied to an image. Any thoughts of what object might be in this image? I'm hearing bicycle. I'd also guess bicycle. Um, let's take a look. So we have on the left the original image and on the right the hog outcome for that image. Okay, so now we know how you could turn a image into something that effectively is more invariant to things you want to be invariant to if you do object detection. So what's nice here is that you are invariant to the color of the bicycle. You are in some sense invariant to the exact location of the bicycle because um, if the bicycle shifts a little bit, those histograms will be effectively the same. If a wheel was a little larger, a little smaller, the histograms would still be quite similar. Um, if the lighting were a little different, the transitions between different parts of the image would still be there. Even in a darker image, you would still get edges in the same location. Of course, it's pitch black, you're not going to get any edges, but any reasonable image, the edges would still be in the same location independent of lighting. And so you get something here that's invariant to a lot of things that you might want to be invariant to. And coming up with something like this effectively is what a lot of people in computer vision uh, were doing in the 90s and the 2000s. And that thinking very carefully about what do we want to be invariant to? What if you change your point of view on something? Um, would the output of this hog computation be invariant to that? We'd like that. But then, of course, you don't want to be invariant to swapping the bicycle out for a car and still have the same outcome because now you lost the ability to distinguish between two categories. Right? So there's a little bit of a trade-off there. You don't want to be fully invariant to everything. Um, and so a lot of work went into thinking about these, and this is one of the best ones that came out of that, the histogram of gradients representation. So now we have our representation of our image. Now we need to do training to train our classifier to classify that this is a bicycle and in other images maybe there's something else. So this would be done in two rounds. The first round, if you look at the training set, there would be positive examples from labeling. Um, it takes a lot of work to label, um, but people will go through the effort to do it because it's critical to get this to work. Um, and then the negative examples Rather than using just labeled examples, what's often done is just collect a lot of random patches. You just download lots and lots of images and take patches in those images and say that's a negative example. It is possible that if you're trying to learn a classifier for bicycles and you randomly download images, that one of those out of the million or millions of images that you download is still having a bicycle in them, that'd be a noisily labeled example. Right? And we know our classifiers are robust to noise. You just have to make sure that there are not too many of these bicycles still in your set of negatives that you download. Based on that, you train your support vector machine. You get out a preliminary classifier. Then there's a round two, which is called bootstrapping or mining hard negatives. What you do there is you go to your training, you go back, revisit what your training set is, and you look at your positive examples and your negative examples, and the negative examples now that you will use are the ones where you're having a hard time getting it right. So you will look at the negative examples. If you classify them positively, you'd refeed them through your training uh, procedure. Um, but also, if they have a margin that's not large enough, you'd refeed them through your training algorithm. And so that way, you zone in on those examples that are close to the decision boundary. And you are able to refine your decision boundary to be more correct based on zoning in on exactly the examples that are right near it. And that gives you your final support vector machine. Okay? So this would give you state-of-the-art results at a time that look like this. So you, after training, you're going to have a test set. Here is uh, the first row we're looking at detecting sofas. So what you see here, you actually see um, six boxes, right, and then a bigger box around it. So effectively what's happening is the procedure I just described is run six times effectively because it's looking for six parts of a sofa. It learned to classify the six parts of a sofa and then from that decide that there's a sofa or not. So you see sofa, sofa, then you see CADs on a heater unit or something um, that it recognizes as a sofa and then an armchair, which maybe is debatable whether that's a sofa or not. Next one is looking for bottles. So we see a catcher bottle detected there. We see some pretty good bottles detected throughout, but we also see um, something in a license, uh, in, a, um, in a 
in the plate detected over there, um, we see a cone detected as a bottle. So the nice thing is the cone shape might be similar to a bottle shape, but we all know that's not a bottle. It should not detect it as a bottle. Then the last row is cats. Actually pretty good at detecting cats. Um, it's a lot of data for that, which often can make it uh, easier to build a good classifier. Um, here is person detection. Actually person detection is originally where hog originated from in that there was a strong interest in detecting people. Why? Because maybe the biggest challenge in developing self-driving cars is reliably detecting pedestrians. Because that's the biggest danger with a self-driving car is that you would hit a pedestrian because the car is so much uh, higher weight than the pedestrian. And so you want to avoid that. Um, and so people started working on pedestrian detection and specialized to pedestrian detection, came up with hog, but then later realized that even for other categories, it's a good way to go. Um, so people detection, pretty good. Car detection, it's working pretty well too. But for example, in the fourth car detection image, it actually thinks it detected one car. It doesn't realize there are two cars there. It just detected many parts of a car. And it said, oh, I detected all the parts of a car. I think there is a car here, but it doesn't realize there's two actually in that box. Um, then horse is at the bottom here. Um, it's doing quite well even when somebody is on the horse, but then a cow um, it thinks is also a horse. And then a part of an airplane it also thinks is a horse. So clearly a lot of room for improvement. Um, but um, this is what was best uh, in 2012, or right before the end of 2012. Since then, people have started to think, well, um, we've spent a lot of time designing things like Hog. It's difficult. It still makes mistakes. Now we have to go back to the drawing board. We have to come up with something new, maybe not a histogram of gradients, but maybe it's something yet a little different and so forth. And so it, it's been a long game of people trying to improve on this and ultimately getting to this performance. In parallel, there's been a thrust on saying, well, how about instead of hand designing those new representations of images, how about just learning how to represent an image in a better way? And if we have enough data, enough computational cycles, maybe we can just learn that and take away all the back then finding computer vision research of coming up with hogs and sifts and so forth and replace it by learning. Okay, so um, it's an article at the time when this kind of started becoming popular. Um, the title was How Many Computers to Identify a Cat? This is a New York Times article uh, covering the Google Brain Project which was uh, originated by Andrew Ng, who was actually my PhD advisor. And so what they were doing there is they looked at what if you download millions and millions of images from YouTube, which is a lot of data there, and you try to see if you let the system on its own learn what might be a good way to represent what's in those images. Rather than using hog, let it figure out on its own a good way to represent those images where somehow they would hope that automatically something would emerge that relates to concepts we care about and sure enough, one of the things that emerged was that it had learned, without ever anybody telling it what a cat is, it actually had learned what a cat looks like. It didn't know it was a cat, but it had learned a new representation where cats were quite prominently featured as something that you could find in this feature space. Um, so we'll look now at how that plays out. But the big idea here is that you move away from engineering how you transform your image into something more invariant to lighting, viewpoint, and so forth, to trying to learn from a lot of data what the inherent invariants are in natural images based on the statistics in those images, and then from there, learn a classifier. Okay, so the basic building block will be the perceptron, which we have covered a couple of lectures ago. So just as a reminder, a perceptron would take in, in this case, three features. Each feature would be multiplied with a weight. Then you'd have W1 times F1 plus W2 times F2 plus W3 times F3. That's your real number that comes out. Then you check, is it bigger than zero or not? Based on that, you output a class label, positive or negative. Okay. So now we bolt multiple perceptrons together. We briefly looked at this um, in one of the earlier lectures on neural nets. And so what's going on here is that we have a first layer of 
features, F1, F2, F3. Then we have a layer of three perceptrons. There can be more, uh, typically with a lot more features and a lot more um, second layer perceptrons. And then there is a final perceptron at the end doing our classification, right? And so it's effectively happening here is that we are pushing the original features through this first layer of perceptrons, which generate new features. Like you might hope for something like, oh, the top perceptron is detecting whether there is a wheel on the left side of the image, and the second perceptron is detecting whether there's a wheel in the right side of the image, and then the um, bottom one is detecting whether there is a horizontal bar somewhere above between those two wheels. If that's what was sitting in there, maybe it allow you to then, at the end, reliably detect whether there is a bicycle in the image or not. I'm not saying that that's what they're detecting, but that's something they, in principle, could be detecting with enough data and the right weights being learned from that and so forth, right? Now you can expand this because it might be that, to be fair, with only one layer of perceptrons before you go to your classification perceptron, you're not able to represent all that much. You're just able to represent a linear classifier in that first layer for each of those perceptrons and a linear classifier might not be good enough to detect whether there is a wheel or a bar or something else. Um, it might be good enough to detect whether there is an edge that's maybe vertical or horizontal or slanted. It might be good enough to detect whether there is a particular circular shape or something, um, but not really a full composite shape. But you can repeat this. And so here's the architecture you might want to play with, which is one where you have your left side being your raw pixels coming in. Then you have a first layer of perceptron units, which might allow you to detect something like edges, parts of circles, and so forth. And the next layer might be able to detect something like a combination of edges. And then working your way through, you hope that towards the end, one of those very last units, maybe the top right unit there, would be able to detect whether there is a cat face right there or not, or maybe a full cat. That's the hope. Now, on each of these edges, there is a weight. And the hope is that your learning algorithm that you run would learn the right setting of those weights to get the right classification at the end. Now, one thing to highlight here is that we're not using the standard perceptron negative one plus one output. We're actually using a smoothed out version everywhere of the output of the perceptron. So what, what are we doing there? Let's say you just use the negative one plus one output. It's very difficult to train those weights because now as you change the weights just a little bit, the output might not change at all. Whereas if you have a smooth function that modulates the output of each perceptron unit, now if you change the weights a little bit, then the output will also change a little bit. And so now it's easier to find in which direction you should tweak the weights to get a better outcome. Okay? Now, you could say, well, why not just output just the real number the perceptron originally would output, just a diagonal line there instead of this unit that we have here? Well, if you just output a line, then your perceptron is just a linear function. And if you compose a sequence of linear functions, you still just have a linear function. So we need some type of nonlinearity in there. Even though it, of course, makes things more complex, it makes it more expressive. And we need that additional expressiveness. We need something nonlinear in there to make it be able to express what we want it to express. All right, so the way to optimize this could be hill climbing, right? So ooh, something. So hill climbing would be, you start somewhere, you repeat, move to the best neighboring state, or at least a better neighboring state. Um, if no neighbors around you are better than where you are, you quit. Um, where neighbors are small perturbations of your weight vector W, which in this case could be millions of entries um, in your weight vector. Properties, of course, of hill climbing are that you could get stuck on plateaus and in local minima, um, which is not a good thing. So the question is how to deal with this. How do we deal with this very large search space, right? We have millions of parameters so we're in, or billions of parameters for some of these. So you know, it's very high dimensional space and you want to find a good optimum. Well, there are different approaches. Um, for the Google Brain Project, what they did back in 2012 was the following. They said, well, um, 
Rather than directly training our classifier based on a bunch of labeled images, let's actually train on just a lot of images we download from YouTube and have no labels for them, but instead train to predict the original image pixels. So what you see here is on the left, three pixels. They get passed through a um, set of units, set of perceptron units, another set of perceptron units. And the hope would be that they re-output ultimately the original pixels. You could say, well, that's very simple. Why not just um, learn something that is the identity mapping and you're done? That's the perfect answer to this question. If all you're asked to do is, if I give you an image, I'll put that same image again. There's a very simple piece of code to write to do that. But there's an ulterior, ulterior motive here. The motive is that what we're really after is trying to find representations of those images that are more interesting than raw pixels. And so the idea here is if you were to feed your pixels through a compression where you cannot retain all the information that was in the original image, but only it retained some information, and then need to re-output the original information, then if you want the compression to be as lossless as possible in terms of having minimal reconstruction error at the end, that compression needs to be something clever. And so the hope is that you can train this compression algorithm from data to compress in a clever way such that it retains the essence in some sense. You can imagine if you see a lot of bicycles, hopefully it would learn that there's a general shape to what bicycles are like, and it would somehow detect there's a bicycle, then store a bit related to there's a bicycle here, and then when it generates the output, know that it needs to present a bicycle somewhere in the output image that then hopefully closely matches the input image. The way I represent it here is that you go from three pixels to two hidden values back to three pixels. In practice, you'll have thousands of pixels. And you'll actually have even more hidden values in your compression part. The reason you'll have even more is that it turns out that rather than trying to comp compress into a small set of hidden units, people have found that it works better to compress into a large set of numbers. But at any given time, only a small set of those numbers is allowed to be non-zero. So it's a different idea behind the compression there where you do have a lot of numbers available, but you're forced to have many of them be zero. Um, the idea there is that that might force the algorithm to find high-level concepts like wheels, handlebars, and so forth, um, which are difficult to find otherwise. So this is called an autoencoder. Um, another part of the motivation here is that um, if you go through this procedure, so you, you could still train it like a perceptron effectively, a multi-layer perceptron. You have a lot of images, and each image needs to use the same sequence of perceptrons to compress and uncompress itself. Right? So you cannot tweak those weights for each image separately. It's one set of weights that is the full compression algorithm for all images. The beauty here is that as you're generating your output, you're generating all pixels. And you're being penalized for any error in any of the pixels. If you have 1,000 pixels, that's a lot of things you're trying to reconstruct. In comparison, if you're just trying to build a classifier, you're just trying to say, oh, it's a cat or not a cat, that's just one bit of information. And so what you get here is actually much stronger supervision. It's not for the original task you care about. You might still ultimately care about classifying what's in the image, but you have an alternative task here that is related that gives you a lot more supervision that, A, you don't have to provide yourself, because the images are already there, and B is just a lot more bits of supervision. So when you train this, um, the layer one would be some compressed version of the input layer. Um, after you did this, you actually repeat this process. It's called a stacked autoencoder. Here we just did a compression and then an uncompression. You can imagine after you're done with this training, you get rid of the uncompression part, and you now feed all your images just through the compression, which gives you a new set of compressed images, and you repeat the same procedure that's shown here for the compressed images, where you need to go from compressed image to, let's say, super compressed image, back out to compressed image. And that way you can re keep repeating this, and the hope would be that <coughs> layer by layer by layer, you get more and more abstract concepts being represented. Okay, so that's a stacked autoencoder for every image. You make a compressed image, learn layer two by using compressed images as the input, and as output to be predicted. 
You can do this for many, many, many layers. However many you have the patience for, um, maybe in practice, eight layers, 10 layers, 20 layers, something like that. Um, some details were left out here, so just in case you want to find out more, and that beyond just having a perceptron unit there, typically what's also done is something called pooling. What does pooling do? It says, as I'm looking at a particular region of the image and I get my output for that region, I'll apply the same perceptron passed over the entire image like a filter, like, like a filter. And in any given small region, that filter will be applied many times, slightly shifted from each other. Rather than keeping all those outputs, you just keep the highest output of that filter for each region. So this makes it invariant to exactly where things are in your image, because now if you shift things in your image a little bit, the maximum output in a certain region will still be roughly the same. So also something called um, complex cells, which relates to essentially suppressing um, outputs of other cells if you are more active than these other cells. It's kind of simplest way to think of it is something like contrast normalization, but you can do the same thing at the deeper layers where it's not just contrast normalization in the image, but in feature space. All right, so the final result then would be that you've trained compressions over multiple layers, and now you can stack this all together and you have a multi-layer compression algorithm or multi-perceptron procedure that gives you a new representation, a more compressed representation of your original image. And the hope would be that in this late layers there, there would be things represented, for example, maybe the top unit would be very active, meaning having a value close to one, if there's a cat face being fed in and zero when that's not the case. But first, we don't force that. We just hope that that's going to be the outcome. Right? Then we can use these high-level features as our new features to feed into our classifier, classify what's in the image based on those features. Now, if they, when they inspected what happened is indeed, if you look at some of these units, what you can do is you can go in, you can see, well, here's a unit that is at the very last layer that's activated quite often, then you can see, well, which are the images in which this unit is activated, and you can essentially make a ranking of images based on how much that particular unit all the way at the end is activated. If you look at what is most prevalent, you'll find that the most prevalent thing is actually faces. Um, and so the most active unit at the end that has something meaningful, it encodes the presence of a face. The second most active thing is a cat face. And so the thinking here is that if there were more and more data of other things than just people and cats, um, you would learn other concepts depending on how often they appear, of course. If something only appears once, it's not gonna waste any of its uh, learning capability to represent that. But if things appear op often enough, it'll start representing them. And you'll learn high-level features about them. Um, the result has been that learning these feature representations um, does a lot better on classifying what's in an image than the prior approaches where you had to try by hand to come up with an alternate representation of what's in an image that's more invariant to things you care about. Um, there's actually a long history of this. It's not, I said this is in the last three years that this has started to dominate on computer vision benchmarks, but it's actually, the ideas have been around for about 60 years, um, but the ideas have only really come to fruition in the last three years, I would say, where finally we've had enough data, enough compute power to actually take advantage of these kind of architectures and effectively let the data speak for itself rather than let researchers and engineers try to encode what features should be. Um, any questions about the computer vision part? Yes. So conceptually what's happening here is you get in a bunch of pixels, right? Then to compute what's coming out of here, which is going to be some real number, in this case between zero and one, right? To compute that number, you pass the input through this 
sum of products of weights times features, which is a standard perceptron unit. This will give you a real number that could be any number from minus infinity to plus infinity. Then you squash it through this unit. What that means is the original number is shown on the horizontal axis. If your original number was uh, roughly zero, then you'd be mapped to the one half over here. If your original number was really, really high all the way out here outside of the box, then you'd be mapped to one, which is where it asymptotes. If your original number was very, 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 very low, around minus infinity, you'd be mapped to zero. So that's what a single unit does. And then all of these units do exactly that same type of computation. But what they do also depends on the weights that are sitting on these inputs. And so even though the type of computation is the same in all of those units, they actually compute something a little different because they have different weights. Now, then the interesting thing is that if you have this kind of architecture, we have many layers and many of those units, it turns out you can show that you can represent fairly arbitrary functions. Like if you want to represent some kind of function that is smooth, and if you had even just one hidden layer with enough units, you'd be able to get arbitrary close to representing that function. Um, the closer you want to get, the more units you'll need, but that's a property of these architectures. And so what you have here is a general, we can think of as a general purpose function approximator. This entire thing, depending on your choice of the weights, will compute a different function and is set up, as has been found in practice, in a way that it generalizes well. So if you fed in a lot of training data, it'll learn a function that, unlike maybe some of the polynomial fittings we saw that might be weird spikes, this will be less susceptible to having those weird spikes just because the way this is set up, it's a, will come out with a smoother function than if you, let's say, had a high order polynomial with just as many free coefficients as you have in this architecture. If they, they want to ask a follow-up question, it seems like you're... Yeah, so if you want to know what they really represent, it depends on what those weights are, right? And it depends on how you set up this architecture. In practice, often what, I'll, what you'll do is you'll actually, you can visualize them. So what you can do is you can, for example, what you can do is you can say, well, what does the output of this unit here represent, right? You would solve an optimization problem. You'd say, if this unit were to output the number one, which is the highest it can get, which input would achieve that, right? And so you'd, you'd then solve a very different optimization problem. Your weights are all fixed now, but your inputs are variable, and you try to find the inputs that maximize the output of a particular unit. You can do this for all these units. Now, as you work your way um, further down here, so for the initial ones here, if you do this with images, what you'll find is effectively that the thing that maximizes the output is exactly what corresponds to the weights sitting on the input. So Effectively, you end up with an input image that perfectly matches the weights, and that's what you're visualizing. Um, as you go further in the network, um, often the things that maximize it might not be as meaningful. Initial layers, they'll often be edges, but then later it's harder to interpret often what it is that maximizes their output. So often what's done is instead look at the training examples. And so you'd pass through your training examples, you'd say, which of the training examples maximally activate this particular unit? And then you'd visualize those and say, oh, it looks, and that's effectively what happened in the very last part of this story here. You'd pick some unit, I'm not saying it's necessarily that one, but something, some unit in the last layer, you rank all your training examples by how much do they activate this unit. And then you see, when you look at that ranking, that all the top ones are cat faces. You say, oh, wow, this unit learned to represent something about cat faces because anytime something highly activates this, it turns out to be a cat face. Um, now, there are all kinds of results there where, um, you know, if this, this will learn things, like if, if, you, if you train this on some data and so forth, you'll learn some weights, but keep in mind, you still need to do all the things that we talked about. You need to do cross-validation, you need to make sure you're not overfitting to your training data, right? Um, you need to keep in mind that if your test data is completely different from your training data, it's not necessarily going to work. 
Um, like if, you know, some images are, all your images are in indoor scenes, let's say, and now all your test images are in outdoor scenes, and the lighting is completely different. It's never understood that different lighting conditions exist. It only understands indoor lighting conditions because of your, the way your train that is, that is set up. Might not understand what's happening in those outdoor images and so forth. Um, and you can run little kind of tricks on these where you say, well, I trained it on some training set and um, I'm feeding in another example of, let's say, a cat. And it, now I'm going to solve a new optimization problem where I'm trying to change minimally the pixels in the input image such that it now doesn't think it's a cat anymore. And you'll see that you can make some very minimal changes that are completely irregular that would never appear in real images. But you make some small changes here and there, and all of a sudden it won't think it's a cat anymore, even though anybody you'd show that picture to would still think it's a cat. Um, and so all those things still apply. You need to be very careful about match between train and test data, cross-validation, overfitting, and so forth. So there are different schemes, and a lot of the work is about what's the most effective way to find the good weights. Like if you read papers about this, a lot of them will be about here's a new scheme to more efficiently find a good set of weights or to more effectively initialize the weights so you start from a better starting point and so forth. That's, I mean, there are some methods that work quite well, but there's still a lot of work in further improving those. Thank you. Sure. Maybe to give you a ballpark, so the, the, some of the best results, the results in 2012 that um, kind of eclipsed the prior approach, it took six days of training on a pretty high-end computer to find the weights that gave that good performance. So keep in mind that you will probably want to try different architectures, right? Because you might not pick the perfect architecture to start out with. Maybe you need more layers, less layers, more units, less units, and so forth. You need to validate that and so forth. So you can, you can see how it takes a while and that you might want to speed up that training from five to six days to something much faster so you can iterate more quickly um, over architectures and ideas that you might have of tweaks to this architecture. Okay, and when you were saying that this kind of can approximate a function, how does that relate to the, the optimal weight vector? Like, does that have to do like the maximum of the function? Um, the optimal weight vector is the one where well, the optimal weight vector would be the one that does best on your test data, but the proxy you use at training time is that you try to do as well as possible in your training data and then make sure you don't overfit, of course. And so at training time, you'd be minimizing prediction error. So for each training example you feed in, there would be a desired output. In the autoencoders, the desired output would be the original pixels. In a classifier, desired output would be the classification label. And so you minimize error on predicting that output. And that's how you define optimality of your weights. All right, let's take a short break here. And after the break, let's start looking at robotics applications. All right, let's talk about robotics. So the first thing we'll look at is robotic helicopters. Um, so the hope would be to fly a helicopter in some extreme flight regimes. So as a motivating example, um, how would you get a helicopter to fly like this? This is called a tick-tock because it mimics the motion of a clock. Um, so it's a way of keeping the helicopter in the air um, where you keep the tail down, keep the helicopter as vertical as possible. All right, so let's think about how we can get a helicopter to do this. So what do we start with? Get a remotely controlled helicopter, right? So we have a helicopter, joystick to control it. A um, Couple of challenges we need to address. First one is we need to track the helicopter because if we don't know where it is, it's very hard to control it to do something very specific. Um, and we need then, based on knowing where it is, we need to decide on what control inputs to send to the helicopter to get the behavior we want. Okay, so here's our setup. We have a joystick, helicopter. Um, the joystick allows us to control it, but we want a computer to control it, so we'll also set up a computer. The computer is 
hooked into the helicopter's remote control. Um, that turns out not super hard to do. The reason is because a lot of um, these remote controls come with what is called a buddy port. The buddy port is a port that was not designed necessarily to design computer controllers, but was designed for if you have a buddy and you are already a good pilot, but your buddy is not a good pilot yet, um, they can hook their remote control in the back of your remote control. And whatever they do gets passed through your remote control onto the helicopter. And many time your buddy does something pretty stupid, you can cancel what they're sending through and take over control and save the helicopter. It's actually quite important because um, building these helicopters can easily take a few days. There's a lot of parts to them. They're quite expensive. I mean, I guess it depends all on your budget, but they cost about $5,000. So you don't want to just have your buddy fly your helicopter. 10 seconds later, it's crashed, and now you are rebuying parts and um, rebuilding for a few days. So you go into the buddy port. Then you put some sensing on board because you want to know what's happening. So what can you put on board? Well, an inertial measurements unit, what is that? It measures um, three-axis accelerometer, meaning if you were to free fall, an accelerometer measures nothing. All readings are zero. But if you do anything but free falling, it measures how much you're accelerating different from free fall. Okay? So for example, if you hold an accelerometer while you're standing still, it'll measure that you're compensating for gravity because you're standing still and gravity would normally have you go down at a pretty fast acceleration. And so if you're standing somewhere, the accelerometer effectively gives you orientation because it tells you in which direction you're compensating against gravity. Um, when you're flying, it's a little different because you could have thrust in all kinds of directions, but still, effectively it gives you a lot of information about orientation, uh, assuming you also know how you're moving. Um, because if you know how you're moving, then you, can, you know your real acceleration you can then see how that's different from free falling and that can give you information about where gravity is pointing relative to your measurement unit. Now to know where you are, you need some measurements. You might use a GPS, which is reasonable. Um, if you want to do something like extreme helicopter acrobatics, a GPS actually doesn't work because it'll lose lock of the satellite signal because you're moving so fast, you're um, flipping your helicopter over, you're not seeing the satellites, um, and so you need something else. Um, so cameras would be a reasonable thing to do. Put some cameras on the ground, have them look up at the helicopter. That way you can triangulate where the helicopter is. The initial measurement unit, in, uh, in addition to measuring acceleration, it also measures angular rates. So it has a three-axis gyro, which measures around each of its axes how fast you're spinning. It also measures the magnetic field. So what that means is the Earth has a natural magnetic field. You know what that field is like, where it's pointed. Roughly north, but not really. It's magnetic north, and then it's actually pointing into the Earth quite a bit more than just along the surface. But it's known where it's pointing. And so if you measure in your own frame the magnetic field, you know to some extent how you are oriented relative to the Earth. OK, so that's what you have. Magnetometer, gyros, accelerometer, cameras looking at the helicopter, and then a joystick to send controls and a computer to process all the information you're getting and decide about what to send out. So the first problem is one of tracking the helicopter. The state of the helicopter consists of position, x, y, z, angles, phi, theta, psi, um, and then the time derivatives of those coordinates, because you also need to know the velocity and angular rates of your helicopter to have the full state. Um, the measurements are the IMU measurements and the 3D coordinates you get from the cameras looking up at the helicopter. So the evidence variables are these over here, and the state variable is 12-dimensional and this set of numbers here. In an HMM, the state variables are sitting in the top layer, and the measurement variables are sitting at the bottom here and are observed. Um, in addition to a model for our sensors, we need a model for our transition model to go from time t to time t plus 1. Well, that's helicopter dynamics, right? You have some function that says, based on the current state, current action, what's the next state? Um, might be some noise on that. You might not have the perfect representation of that function, but there is something like that that you want to use. OK, so what we now know how to do, based on what we've seen before, is we can run an inference in a hidden Markov model to find 
the state of the helicopter at any given time. Okay, so that's the forward algorithm. We know how to do that. We now know how to track the helicopter. Now we need to figure out how to control it. That's a mark of decision process, right? We have a state, we have a set of actions, um, four actions, and we want to decide what action to take um, such that we achieve some kind of goal. There's some dynamics telling us how actions relate to the next state, and there is some noise potentially in it. Okay, so what are the actions available to us? With a helicopter, you have four actions available to you. Um, the first one is the, let's start with the collective pitch control. So the collective pitch is controlling the angle of attack of the main rotor. So the steeper the angle of attack, the more area pushed down. The shallower the angle of attack, the less area pushed down. You can even make it negative, make it negative, now you're pushing air up, or if you're upside down, you're pushing air down again, and so you can fly inverted. Um, so that's how you generate or control your main thrust. Um, so it's not controlled by the speed of the motor on the helicopter, it's just controlled by the angle of attack. Nice thing is that that's a lot more reactive. You can change that angle of attack very quickly, making your helicopter very snappy to control, whereas if you had to change the uh, speed of your engine, that would be much slower, you won't be able to react nearly as quickly. Then to go somewhere, rather than just up down, um, you have your cyclic pitch controls. What do they do? A cyclic pitch controls control the difference between your angle of attack left and right and front back. So your main rotor is sweeping around and the angle could be different left right and front back. That will allow you to push down more or less air in the front and the back, left right. Accordingly, that allows you to spin your helicopter, roll or pitch. So you can rotate around your forward axis or you can rotate around a sideways axis. Right. Now if you want to go somewhere, you can for example, first rotate around your sideways axis, pitch your nose down, and now your vertical thrust partially becomes forward thrust and you can fly forward. Then the last thing you need is uh, tail rotor thrust. The reason you need that is because, well, maybe you want to decide where you're looking, so that could be a reason, but the main reason you want it is because as you generate a torque on the blades to spin them around so they can push air around, you have a counter torque on the body of the helicopter. And so if you experience that counter torque without compensation, your body would just be counter spinning to the main rotor and actually counter spinning quite fast, uh, which is an impractical way to control or fly your helicopter. So you have a tail rotor. The tail rotor generates a torque that pushes against that, controlled the same way as the main rotor. The angle of attack of the tail rotor determines how much thrust you're generating, and so it'll compensate for the counter torque, but also allow you to point your nose wherever you want to point it. So those are the four controls you have. Keep in mind, there's nothing in there that tells you, oh, I can fly forward or sideways. Those controls don't exist. Out of the six degrees of freedom of your helicopter, you can control four, the three angles effectively, the three angular rates, right? And the upward, downward velocity, but you cannot directly control your forward or sideways speed. You have to actually reorient yourself to allow it to go in certain directions. So can we solve this MDP yet? We have state space, action space, transition model, so we need one more thing. We need a reward function that specifies what is the right thing to do. So let's assume we want to hover. So reward function for hover could look like this. Let's break this down. Um, we always want high reward, right? But for helicopter flight, it's more natural to think about error, like deviating from where you want to be. So we're going to define our rewards as being all negative. Right? Whenever you are not where you're supposed to be, you get a negative reward. And the further you deviate from where you're trying to be, the more negative that reward is going to be. So you see here is the first one is negative alpha, which is some coefficient, times x minus x star squared. x star, y star, z star is where you want to be, where you want to be hovering. And so we're penalizing for deviating from that. We're then also penalizing for non-zero velocity in the last three terms. All right, so now we have a reward function. We can run our MDP solver and see what comes out and then put it in our helicopter. So let's do that. So here we have the control policy that came out of it. We have a helicopter hovering quite reliably. And in fact, upside down in this case. And we know how that works because you can have a negative angle of attack of the main rotor blades, which double negatives will cancel out and you're staying up in the air. Um, it's also a more efficient way to fly because the area you pull in comes in at some speed, but the area you push out 
is at twice the speed and so the fast air this way is not dragging over your helicopter body the fast air is going below you whereas if you fly right side up the fast air would go over the helicopter body and drag you down a little bit um, for the helicopter we flew in uh, my phd research um, you could generate about three g's of acceleration flying upside down only about 2.6 g's uh, flying right side up so it does make a difference in terms of control authority you have All right, so now you might look at this and say, well, my ask yourself the question, was this hard? Like, is it hard to get a helicopter to do this, right? I mean, it, it was just done, so clearly we know how to do this. So in general, if somebody presents you with a control problem, you can ask yourself the question, is this a hard control problem or an easy control problem? This is an example of a hard control problem. And the reason this is a hard control problem is because the dynamics of a helicopter is unstable, meaning that if you don't continuously adjust the controls you send to your helicopter, it'll just drop out of the sky. One way to think of it is like, let's say you have a very tall broom, you're balancing on the palm of your hand. It's very, very tall, and you can't palm it like this. You just have to balance it on top. And now you're supposed to walk somewhere without having it tip over and fall. And let's assume there's even a very high weight, maybe all the way at the top. So it's, when it starts tipping a little bit, it's going to start tipping a lot faster very quickly. Right? That's instability. It's like things, once things go bad, they get worse quite quickly. You need to continuously adjust to prevent that. Right? And so if you were to walk with this broom, and let's say you maybe wear something on top of your hand so you can't even sense it, you don't even feel which direction it might be falling, you close your eyes, there's no way you walk from one place to another place and that broom is still on there. Right? If you're blindfolded, you can't see anything, can't feel anything. So similar for a helicopter, unstable dynamics. If you don't continuously monitor where it is and adjust to it, you're going to lose it. It's going to drop and essentially drop like a rock. They don't want to fly. Is what our pilot used to say. We're just forcing them to fly, but you continuously have to keep forcing them to fly or they'll just be dropping. Now, what else makes it difficult? There are unstable systems that are not super hard to control. What makes it additionally difficult is that the dynamics is complicated. So you can have an unstable system that is very easy to understand how it behaves, but here you have complex aerodynamics that makes it difficult to even build a medium accurate simulation of what would happen if you apply some controls. And of course that makes it harder. What that means effectively is that the MDP we've been working with is not a perfect match with the real world. It's, it was a good enough match after a lot of work to get this to work and actually took a lot of machine learning to build from data the exact transition model for that MDP. Um, but in general, it's very hard to get a good match between your helicopter dynamics and simulation and in the real world. And then when you solve your MDP, well, um, if it's not matched up, it might not work. So those are two big challenges, instability and complex dynamics. But now let's go back to our original problem of doing more dynamic flight rather than staying in place, right? You can ask yourself the question, well, the helicopter was upside down, but who flipped it over? Well, actually a pilot flipped it over you could argue it's hard to flip it over and then stabilize, and then it keeps it stabilized, which is difficult, but why not have the computer flip it over? Because at the time, we didn't know how to do that. We had to ask our pilot to flip it over to then let a computer stabilize it once it's been flipped over. Okay? So we need to do a flip then. So what does it mean to do a flip? Right? How do you write down the reward function for a flip? Because your reward function in MDP will define what you think is the right thing to do. If you write down a reward function that's terrible, it'll do something terrible and it'll do the right thing because you asked it to optimize that terrible reward function. So to write this down, effectively you need to think about how can a helicopter flip? Can a helicopter just flip in place? Actually it cannot because you're just rotating, you would start dropping, you'd accelerate down. So you have to maybe thrust yourself up, get some momentum, as you have that momentum, start flipping and you're falling back down and then restabilize yourself. Maybe that's the way to do it. So exactly how much you need to push yourself up? What's the right thing to do here? It's very difficult to define a reward function for this. Um, you might argue, well, I don't care. I know how to define a reward function for this. I'm just going to say a flip is just staying in place and rotating, just like hover was staying in place. A flip is just staying in place and rotating. You're just not going to get the perfect score because it's not possible. You're just going to try to be as close as possible to rotating in place and that's my reward function. Okay, well, that's what we thought. So that's what we did. We said, let's just try to keep it in place, tell it to stay as close as possible to in place, and see what happens. As 
clearly not staying in place, but that's all right. We knew that was not possible. All right, so wh what happened here? We told it to stay in place. It solved in simulation, whatever it thought was the best way to stay in place. Now, a little important thing to know here is if you're solving MDPs that are very large, as we've seen, you might need some function approximation. So the natural way to do function approximation for tasks like this is to define your control policy as a policy that is going to keep you on track, on a target trajectory. And now you don't need to find controls for every possible situation, but just close to the target trajectory, find a good controller. And so that's what we did in simulation. We found a good controller to stay close to the target trajectory. But in reality, the target trajectory that we posited that worked quite fine in simulation actually was not flyable. So it starts trying to stay close. It's actually not that close. It deviates. And now it starts hitting a regime where it's actually not been trained. Its control policy was not trained to know what to do when it's deviating that much from the target. So it's starting to deviate even more. And as it goes along, it starts deviating more and more and more. Its control policy that I learned in simulation becomes less and less applicable, ultimately completely inapplicable. It kills the engine, and it drops like a rock. Right? So this helicopter, um, we lost. Um, the interesting thing, though, one interesting tidbit here is that actually the pilot took back control, because our computer's just on the buddy port, right? I mean, we asked him to let it go as long as possible to see what happened, because we were very optimistic this would work. And so he let it go quite long, um, too long to save the helicopter. Nevertheless, actually, this helicopter went behind the trees. We couldn't see the helicopter. The pilot, nevertheless, righted that helicopter with the engine off and still got it to land on its landing gear. Now, it was landing with a very high speed, which still mostly killed the helicopter. But he was still able to actually get it to land without seeing it, just having so much intuition about how helicopters behave and writing it while not seeing it. Um, with the engine dead, um, how does that work? So um, essentially what you can do with a helicopter that every pilot is supposed to be able to do is an auto rotation. An auto rotation is where the engine dies and now you effectively use the airflow through the blades as you're descending to spin up the blades and keep them going at high speed. And so effectively what you're doing, you're converting your altitude potential energy into kinetic energy, not in the body of the helicopter dropping like a rock, but in kinetic energy of the blades spinning around. Now the beauty then is that because all your control authority is in the blades, by changing the angle of attack of the blades, you still have control authority over your helicopter, and you can actually control where you want to go. Um, now if you apply too much control authority, your blades will slow down, and you will start dropping. So there's a little bit of a trade-off there. You, can, you cannot apply much control authority, just a tiny little bit. You actually need to cleverly save up all your control authority pretty much till you're right above the ground, at which point you use all of it to slow your helicopter down and hopefully land it. If you use all of it and you use it wrong, then you drop and it might not be good. Um, in practice, the measure of success for auto rotation is often whether the people survive. Like people don't, you're not worried anymore about your helicopter, but you're, you want to land well enough that people are still alive. Um, it's tricky because you actually have these heavy blades above you if you're in a real size helicopter. You land at high speed. There's a lot of stuff above you that can actually come down on you as you land if there's a lot of uh, momentum. One interesting tidbit here is that if you fly a helicopter, sure your pilot should know how to do this when the engine dies keep you all alive. Um, this might be important. But the other thing that might happen is that your tail rotor could fail. If your tail rotor fails, you start spinning around. There's no way to control a helicopter when you're spinning around with tail rotor failure. Um, so what you do then is, why are you spinning? Because the engine is applying a counter torque to the helicopter body. So then you just switch off the engine. And so you deliberately go into an auto rotation maneuver. I mean, hopefully you're close to some reasonable landing spot. but you deliberately switch off the engine to not have that spinning, do your auto rotation maneuver, and land. That's the right thing to do if your tail rotor fails. There's several reasons. So our pilot actually, after the helicopter engine died, took back control because he knew our autopilot was not going to do anything with the engine then. Um, and unfortunately, the blades were spinning very slowly by that time. And so the helicopter was not high enough up to fully spin up 
the blades again. If we had been much higher up, maybe he could have spun up the blades a lot more again, regained control authority, and saved our helicopter because we were at medium altitude. The blades were going too slow, not enough control authority, just enough to ride the helicopter, get the landing gear at the bottom and the blades at the top, but still not enough to fully save our helicopter, but still pretty amazing. So there are all these amazing pilots out there. So why shouldn't we just learn from those pilots? Instead of trying to learn in simulation and so forth to fly and then it's maybe not matched with reality, it doesn't work, why not hire an awesome pilot, which we're doing anyway, record their flight and then fly like they fly? So that's what we started doing um, after this uh, crash. And so what you see here are demonstrations of our pilot flying, the way he thinks is a good way to fly an airshow. We had him fly the actual helicopter, but this is the recordings from output from our HMM position and orientation over time, multiple demonstrations. None of them are perfect, partially because our sensory measurements aren't perfect, partially because the pilot doesn't do everything perfectly, but they're quite similar, a sequence of a set of aerodynamic maneuvers. What we can then do is we can say, let's learn a trajectory that we are going to use as our target that's actually flyable, okay? So we can use an HMM for this again, lots of HMMs here. Um, we have a hidden sequence, which is the intended trajectory of our pilot. We have the demonstrations of our pilot. Those are observations of what he was intending to do. And then we can run inference in the HMM, but sometimes there's a different timing in execution, so we need to worry about that first. So we can do probabilistic alignment of these observations with our hidden state. So we fill something into our hidden state just to kick it off. Then we do an alignment with something called dynamic time warping, which has been invented uh, twice, once for biological sequence alignment in the 1970s, and then again in the late 1970s for speech recognition. Once you use that, you can actually find a good alignment of pairs of sequences, and then we don't need that fake fill in anymore. We can run inference in our HMM, find the sequence of helicopter states, and then we can repeat this time alignment, and we can repeat inference in the HMM until we find a good target. So here's what the aligned demonstrations look like. This is the white helicopters, the denoised version, and everything's been time aligned. This is now going to be, the white one is going to be our target trajectory that we want to fly. Okay? If you want to look at something more um, concrete, here is a double loop. The black is what we infer. The colored are the demonstrations that were used from which we got the denoised black version. Okay? So the result that we infer is a lot cleaner. In addition, to getting out this target trajectory, what you can do now is you actually can run model learning. You can run model-based reinforcement learning, so to say effectively, you can take the data along these trajectories and learn models that are very specific to the maneuver you're doing. You say, well, at the top of the loop, how does a helicopter behave? You now have a bunch of aligned data. You can fit to that data to build a model specifically for being at the top of a loop and so forth. So now we have a good model, a good target. Let's refind our optimal controller and see what it flies like. So this inverted takeoff, this is fully autonomous. Hover. Now it's going to switch to forward flight. And now it's starting to do aggressive maneuvers, which are maneuvers um, that weren't possible before. Um, but Learning from our pilot's demonstrations allowed us to do that. Is this a loop? If you're really good at doing loops and you want to show it off, you just pirouette your tail around at the top. Um, stall turn is a way of changing direction. You can come out tail first. Um, these are fast backward flying circles called hurricanes. You can fly this helicopter up, to about, helicopter up to about 55 miles an hour, which is pretty fast. It's not a huge helicopter. Um, inverted flight, knife edge fall, and then stationary rolls. These are some of the hardest maneuvers in the air show because the helicopter is maneuvering in the airflow it just generated itself, which is a much more complex airflow than flying into clean air. And here's the TikTok, fully autonomous. And this is inverted hover. We actually also have been able to do auto rotation landings. So we actually have also been able to teach this helicopter to land with the engine off. Um, let's see. It's almost 11. 
So let's keep legged locomotion for next lecture. Uh, this is it for today.